everyone. It has been so much fun listening to all the stories. Where can I keep my water? <laughs> down here? Okay. Oh, there's lots of water down here. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's been so great listening to all your stories about reorganization because it rings so true to me. Um, we're a small organization and we, um, I'm the staff <laughs> pretty much and we, we know how difficult it is to, uh, to do projects like this. There's just not enough shelf space here. Um, I'll take that one. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I wrote it out because I'm chatty. If I don't write it out, then I'll keep you here for hours. Okay, so in partnership with the Historical Society Board of Directors and their committees, I manage the Fredericton Region Museum um, and with the care of uh, the collections, uh, wait, I'm going to start. I manage the Fredericton Region Museum. Um, we care for collect, uh, collections. We, we, I, I look after storage, exhibits of objects, um, as well as I oversee the staff programs and outreach initiatives. What I'm saying there is, as the executive director, I do everything. I do everything from sweep them off the floors to collections management, accessing in objects, taking things in, uh, exhibit development, oversee staff, oversee volunteers. I am a catch-all for everything that happens in the museum. So the museum has a large collection, and I'm told it's one of the largest collections in the, um, in the province. We have probably, oh, 10 to 15,000 objects. I couldn't tell you exactly how much because, frankly, it's probably been 50 years since it's been inventoried thoroughly. Um, a lot of it is archival, which is measured by meters. So. I would expect some of that in, includes that as well. So during most of the year, I work by myself. I have students during the summer, volunteers, and the occasional off-season contract. But most, most of the time, I'm pretty much it for about eight months of the year. Uh, managing, managing the collection is tricky with little staff, so I'm heavily reliant on volunteers who are looking for experience and training. Most of my volunteers are elderly. I get some student volunteers. In the winter time, I don't have as many, as I will explain here in a minute. Today, I'm, going, I'm here to talk to you about my experience with collection storage and museum health and safety, something I'm sure you all thought of. I'm very interested in preserving artifacts, but at the same time, I want to consider the health and safety of the people working in the collection. Museums are full of hazards. Some hazards are more obvious than others. So unless you have taken the time to identify and learn what they are or are shown, you would never know. I'm going to start by giving a little background information on how I found myself so deeply interested in health and safety. Okay. There's my building. That's where I live. I don't know why they just don't build a room on the side for me, because frankly, I spend more time here than I do at home. The building that houses a museum is a national historic building. It's big, stone, and beautiful. I'm very lucky. Every time I walk, this is my office, every time I walk to work every day, I just pinch myself because I cannot believe that I get to spend so much time in such a beautiful historic building. The collection is stored in a series of rooms on the third floor. So where you see the shutters closed is where the collection is. Um, and in part of the attic, that half of the attic right over there. So ladders getting up to the attic, mine's not much different. Um, the rooms have high ceilings, except the attic, uh, and narrow doors. I had a really tall summer student that had to dock every time he went through a door. Um, there are several challenges in our storage. The floors are uneven. Um, I know a thing or two about floors that do that. The attic stairs are steep, as Jean Mans and Jason and Greg can attest to. Uh, the building is uninsulated and unheated, so we don't have any insect problems but we can't work in the collection during the winter months, which is why I have a drop off in volunteers every winter. Um, once they feel the chill, <laughs> they disappear, and sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't. So retraining is an ongoing thing. The attic can get so warm in the summer that employees have suffered from heat stroke after working up there too long. I have had to treat my staff for heat stroke after working in the collections, and I have an air conditioner here. I had to fight, beg, and plead 
for the province to let me install it because the province owns the building. It's not, it's contrary to the heritage nature of our building, so they didn't want us to have it. I said, well, health and safety trumps heritage nature. I'm putting it in. <laughs> they said, don't use any screws or anything. I'm like, that hole was already there. So, <laughs> so every time I make a new hole in the building, it was already there. <laughs> our electrical is old, trippy in surgery. Keeping computer equipment in good working order takes care and planning. Um, technology comes here to die. Computer motherboards blow up in the middle of the night for no apparent reason. You can come to work and, not, and three computers will be dead. That's not, that's happened. Okay. I have little control of light because every fixture in the collections is on the same switch. So if I want to turn on the light in the room with the computer in it, which is also where the outlet light switches. So if I want to use a computer, I have to turn on the lights. But then every light on third comes on. And I've tried to take measures to put in those cord thingies that you pull. I got electrocuted, so I gave up on that. So when I turn one light on, they all turn on as well. The archival records are stored at the Provincial Archives on the university campus. Beautiful, brand new system up there. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. But they go through us for, me for processing first. So you can only imagine how long that can take. When I started working at the museum in March 2008, so we were almost on our eighth anniversary here, I'll drink a bottle of wine in celebration, the storage areas of the museum were in need of tender, loving care. I'm being kind. You couldn't walk from here to there without having to dodge, weave, and duck, and climb. There were piles of paper everywhere. My predecessor has had no concept of what collection storage was. There were more artifacts on the floor than there were on shelves or hung or anything. And, oh, dear God, the sh <laughs> <laughs> You couldn't imagine, you just, you, you, you couldn't imagine. Things were being damaged, it was. <laughs> okay, so, where was I? <laughs> About 20 years of archival records that need to be called and transferred to the provincial archives um, had piled up up there. So it took me five years to transfer those to the archives and several interns. The old exhibits and uh, store fixtures that they had in the museum that no longer used were just dumped up there. So I had all these old cabinets and light fixtures and pieces of plywood and big slabs of glass that weren't artifacts but just sitting there doing nothing. And um, they all went to the dumpster. Several things were being stored on that floor that didn't even belong to us. Are we doing storing other people's stuff? We don't have room to store our own stuff. Why are we storing theirs as well? So, with a team of volunteers, we started to work organizing and straightening. But we got to work so fast and intensely that we didn't think about taking before pictures. Oh, sorry. I have no before pictures for you. You'll just have to use my, my expressive language <laughs> to imagine. If I had known that I was going to be here talking to you, I would have, but say la vie. We sorted, straightened, and removed anything that we knew we would never use and what did not belong to us. And we did this undercover, because museum people are pack rats. Like, don't throw out that slab of chip glass. I'm like, why not? Well, we might use it. I'm like, it's cutting me holding it. I don't think we'll ever use it. So off to the dumpster it goes, but in the cover of darkness, the night before the dumpster gets dumped so that they can't find it the next day. <laughs> <laughs> because I did have one volunteer insist we go in the dumpster and pull all the garbage out. And I'm like, no. If you want that done, you do it. I learned very quickly how to say no. So, for unknown reasons, our storage space was being used by other people. We had all this crap up there. We filled the dumpsters several times. I can't even begin to tell you how many times. We had a flood that year. We were in a floodplain, and I had no power because when you're in a floodplain, the first thing they take away from you is your power. Um, and so we had nothing else to do but fill the dumpster, so we did. And um, then we, we took our, we got rid of the stuff that didn't belong to us, we transferred the archive records up. That was about five years, so you can walk up there now and not hang your head in shame. After about a year of sorting and organizing, you can tell that progress had been made. We still had a lot to do, but it was a tremendous improvement. Most of the floors were cleared off, so we could start walking without worrying about tripping or stepping on artifacts. I could sweep and mop. <laughs> it was such a thrill to be able to go up with a broom <laughs> and to mop the floor. It was amazing. 
Shortly after my 2009 summer students left, I had a meeting with representat representatives from a granting agency and was asked to show them some of the work we had accomplished in our storage areas. Moments of pride. The evening before our tour, I wanted to finish moving a few things. I'm a little OCD. That's something you'll learn about me. I'm OCD. Um, <laughs> just a little. Um, but anyway, so we ha I wanted to move a few objects around before they came in. And I wanted to put my best foot forward. That's important. I think Jason knows where this might be going. <laughs> I wanted to make a great impression. So anyways, I'm going to go back just a little bit. I have a bad knee. Oh, where did you come from? Oh, yeah. That, that's, those shells are in the garbage. I help lug them down and throw them in myself. Anyways, I have a bad knee. I tore the cartilage in my right knee while putting my child in his car seat several years ago. I have learned to ignore the injury most of the time, and I developed strategies to prevent it from limiting my effectiveness. I, um, I don't have time to go to the doctor for these things. I just don't have time. My job's too busy. Um, one strategy that I've, I've learned is uh, to take my high heels off. I love my high heels. They're my best friend. Um, and when I carry heavy objects, uh, I do that in flat feet, it's easier. The cartilage doesn't flip up, it doesn't snap or anything. It's much less painful if I have flat feet. So that day, everybody had, I was all by myself. I went up to third floor, I slipped off my shoes and started to move some objects around. It was warm, so they were sandals. So I was barefoot. So I was carrying large, heavy objects from one room to the next. But what I didn't realize, that one of my summer students had broken some glass, not an artifact, some glass um, in one of the storage areas in a dark corner before leaving. And um, in his rush to get things done on his checklist, he had forgotten to sweep it up. He was funny that way. Great student, just loved him to pieces, but he could be forgetful on some things. But the glass was in an obscure corner of the storage room and you would never, you would never know it was there. Um, so in my rush to move things around, I stepped in it. And um, as much as I love my students, sometimes they, they're overwhelmed by the vastness of museum man, uh, collections management. And this, this summer student was no exception. He, he um, was so anxious to get things done that he didn't sweep it up. But he was a great student, but unfortunately, I found his glass with my bare foot. And I bled a nice, bloody mess. So I grabbed a few Kleenexes and headed to my office on the first floor where I had a box of first aid supplies. Now I hesitate to call it a first aid box. It was essentially a red toolbox with things in it. Things like band-aids and smelling salts and old wooden cotton swabs. So you can only imagine the last time that thing was stocked. I think they stopped making those in what, 1970s? <laughs> so yeah. I cleaned up my foot and disinfected the cuts and the worst of it was under my big toe, and I wrapped it the best I could with the limited supplies I had. I really didn't think much about it. I mean, if I didn't think much about my knee, I certainly didn't think much about that, um, except to examine it and clean it each day until I thought it had healed. Well, my timeline might be off a little bit because this is something that happened in 2009, but I remember that no sooner did I think my toe was healed, it started to swell. Um, I started to treat it again, polysporin, everything I can think of, but it, it swelled a lot. <laughs> and after a couple of days, my husband coerced me to go see a doctor. <laughs> so, so I did. So he knows how much I, I hate taking time away from work, but my toe was looking rather ugly at this point, and it did not look like it was going to heal without seeking medical attention. So I told my doctor, and she, I, well, I, my story, and she immediately felt that I must have had a piece of glass lodged in my toe in order to x-ray. The problem with clear glass is that it doesn't show up easily on an x-ray, and my results didn't really tell us anything. They took like three x-rays of the thing, different angles, I couldn't see anything. My doctor gave me some antibiotic cream, and I started to follow her treatment. The toe was ugly enough, okay, it was so ugly. <laughs> that she asked me to visit her office every day so that she could examine the toe and wrap it herself. I didn't take a picture. You tried to get me to take a picture, but I didn't take a picture. <laughs> it was too ugly. <laughs> anyway, 
anyways, so while this was happening, the Museum Association was hosting their annual conference. Luckily, it was in Fredericton, so I didn't have to miss it. So I would go to the doctor first thing in the morning, then head over to the conference uh, later on, which was great because I was presenting at that conference, so I really didn't want to miss it. The toes swelled a lot. It was a horror show. I had to borrow a pair of sneakers because I couldn't fit my wrapped toe in my cute little shoes. It was really a nightmare, not being able to wear high heels. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> it did eventually start to heal and the swelling started to go down, but no sooner did my doctor think I had beaten the infection, the toe swelled again. It was like a little balloon just popped right back up. This time it was a little different. It itched like nothing I had ever experienced before. Uh, not just the area with the wound, but the entire toe itched and eventually the neighboring toe did too. So. My doctor sent me to the emergency room where a foot specialist happened to be working that day. And he took one look at my swollen, itchy toe and showed me where he was planning on amputating if the infection did not improve immediately. He said that is the minimum that he would take off. He was thinking he might have to take off more if I didn't get a grip on this infection because I had red striations shooting out the foot at this point. <sighs> So, <laughs> that just left a huge impression on me. He ordered another x-ray and changed the prescription for the second time, but again, the x-ray revealed nothing. And at this point, I was becoming very motivated to trying and figuring out what was going on. So, that weekend, my toe became intolerable. It was swollen, red, itchy, and showed no improvement with this new medication, none whatsoever. My doctor wasn't working, so I decided that this deserved a trip to the after hours clinic, and I took my place in line. After several hours of waiting, the doctor examined the toe and listened to my story, and he decided to change the medication again. So I, after I um, started to apply this new tube of Miracle Goo, that my toe started to heal, finally. And it was a long, slow healing process, but it eventually returned to normal size and appearance. And yes, I could wear my high heels. So excited, I could return those awful sneakers. All in all, it was about a month between stepping on the glass and the after hours clinic visit. So I went through this for about four weeks. And the toe itself took several more months to fully heal. Even up to a year or so after, I, I could still it, it itch. And something solid did come out of it eventually, but it was awful. Awful! <laughs> anyway, so this experience set me on a new path. Suddenly, health and safety became very important to me. It's always been important, but this incident really made it a higher priority. So over the next several years, I researched and compiled a lot of notes on health and, um, for a health and safety program for our museum a program that would work for a small museum with minimal staffing and minimal funding. Um, and after consulting with my board of directors, I sat down and assembled a policy and training program for staff and volunteers. Altogether, I provided them with a 158-page review document plus several policies and documents for their consideration. They love me. <laughs> my board is so hardworking. <laughs> Yes, so anyways, I made several recommend recommendations for the board to consider that would bring the museum in line with provincial laws surrounding health and safety in the workplace. Anyway, so my board was supportive and thrilled with my work, but I don't think they were overly excited about having to review the 158 pages I gave them, plus attached documents. But putting this document together made me aware of the laws in New Brunswick surrounding health and safety. These laws are easily overlooked in small volunteer reliant institutions that for the most part of the year have one employee, but um, they are important nonetheless. Just because they only have one employee doesn't mean they're exempt from laws either. There are laws around that, and I know them now. So I was surprised to learn that employee, employers are required to provide health and safety training. Um, I was surprised because I had never received health and safety training for many, many years working at different jobs for different companies. <laughs> I had never received any health and safety training from anybody, so I don't think it's just museums that, you know, or my institution that is not aware of all this. Um, 
most of my past work experience has been with larger companies that have the resources to provide the training, but they simply don't. And I discovered a lot of other things too. For instance, workplaces with five employees or more are required to have a health and safety policy. Most of the year I'm by myself or I might have one other person working with me, but apparently we're not exempt from this law. And during the summer I usually have five summer students. So therefore, that would be six on staff. I am required to have a health and safety policy and to, pre to provide training. So even though I only have the required number for two months out of the year, I'm still required to do it. I found out that all employee orientation and training records must be kept on hand at the museum for at least three years. So not only are you train them, you have to document that training and you have to keep that record for three years. Orientation documents are to be kept in the personnel files along with training records. Apparently, WorkSafe New Brunswick's health and safety officers have the right to ask for and review employee orientation and training records at any time. So if something happens and they wanted to confirm that this employee had been trained, they can walk in my door any time and ask for this documentation. So I had no idea. I also learned the requirements for first aid kits, which are near and dear to my heart. Uh, we now have a fully stocked first aid kit on each floor of the museum. So that way if I cut my toe on third, I don't have to run down to first um, to treat the injury. Each kit has an inventory checklist and a use log to ensure we know if anything needs to be replenished. We also have safety gear for working with hazardous materials, wet floor signs, safe ladders, emergency exit maps, nitro gloves in various sizes a lab coat, all that stuff. We didn't have any of that stuff before I started. I mean, we had ladders, but they weren't great. Apparently, for businesses with more than one employee, but less than 19, you must have at least one first aid provider with valid training. That would be me. I took a course because, I, because once I have a contract employee during off season or a student during the summer, I'm required to have a trained first aider. And I can't depend on the students or contract employees having that, so the only consistent person there is me, so it made sense for me to go get the training. That's fun. Um, your first aider's credentials must be posted. We came up with a few ways to identify our first aiders in our museum, but um, you have to post those credentials somewhere where everybody can see it. For businesses with five to 19 employees, a health and safety representative must be named and their name and position posted, and that would be me again, <laughs> because I'm the only consistent person down there. So I'm everything, like I said. Our orientation plan includes women's training. Who here knows what women's stands for? If I saw probably on the slide, okay, good. Who has women's training? Okay, a lot of you, that's really outstanding. WIMIS stands for Workplace Hazardous Materials Information System, and it, it provides information for the safe use and handling of hazardous materials and controlled products that may be found in the workplace. Again, I've been in the workforce for a long time and only recently received my first WIMIS training. My first WIMIS training came out because I did this project. I had never seen this before in my life. I had no idea this even existed. And, um, it's law, it's been law for several years to have women's training, but I talk to a lot of people that don't know what that is. Anyway, so women's training um, involves learning a series of hazard symbols and having material safety data sheets for all chemicals in your workplace available for your employees. So if you have a bottle of liquid paper, you're supposed to have a material data sheet for that. That's a hard one to find. Um, your cleaning utensils, Windex, Anything that's a liquid and a chemical, you have to have a material safety data sheet for. So I actually worked at a workplace, they couldn't find the liquid paper material data sheet, so we weren't allowed to have liquid paper <laughs> because we didn't have the sheet for it. Everything from Windex, fire extinguishers, liquid paper, all considered hazardous materials. This has um, been the most difficult part of managing the program. I, I don't think you realize how many chemicals you have in the workplace until you start looking for data sheets. All employees are required to have women's training every year in New Brunswick, and it's probably the same throughout the country. But if your staff is under 25, you're required to provide the training during orientation regardless of the last time they had women's training. That change in law happened in September 2014, and I know because I'm on first name basis with the people in the office at WorkSafe now, <laughs> and they called to tell me. Therefore, if I have a returning student employee under 25, which most of them are, 
uh, who had women's training five months ago, I have to retrain him or her. So this is just standard in orientation. Everybody goes through it, whether you've had it or not. Say, come on, Tom. There we go. There he is. That's Tom. During the development of the program, I realized that museums are unique work environments. Hazards are not always obvious, and artifacts don't have women's symbols on their labels, if they have labels. After a lot of research, I found a few curatorial specific health and safety documents that I used to compile a chapter in our program to train our employees who work in the collection and may be exposed to hazardous artifacts. Can you believe there's hazardous artifacts in their collection? It's like, oh, <laughs> we have a huge medical collection, so we've got lots of tubes of crazy things. Um, includes information on types of hazards in a museum collection, hazards communication standards, and hazardous objects that are easily identified, like Bali Um People, here, this one's a fun one. People, both paid and unpaid, who work in collections are not permitted to begin work until they have finished health and safety training and have read the curatorial chapter. I don't even let them set foot in collections until they've read that chapter. This way they are aware of hazards in the collection such as pesticide residue, arsenic, cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate negatives, firearms, edge, edged weapons, ammunition, exploded munitions, medical objects, drugs and chemicals. And I believe I have all of those. Uh, pest and asbestos as well, yes. To give you an example, collections employees are taught that arsenic can be absorbed through the skin. I, don't, I didn't see any taxidermy stuff here. Was there any taxidermy things in the collection? No. In the basement. Ah, so you might find, I, I'm be curious to know if you know this already. So arsenic can be absorbed through the skin, inhaled and ingested. Exposure to it may lead to chronic disorders and it's a known carcinogen. When working with contaminated or suspected contaminated collections such as birds and mammal specimens, my staff is not allowed to touch the specimen with their bare skin. They have to wear nitro gloves, a lab coat and a dust mask. Employees and volunteers are instructed to assume that all pre-1970 taxidermied and insect specimens have arsenic. So if any of them are pre-1970, which they probably are given the nature of your collection, I would recommend you suit up before you touch them. Um, come on, there we go. This is Tom's handiwork, I love Tom. Um, he's gone now though, he's a summer student that went off to Montreal. When hazards are identified, my staff is instructed to label the hazard to the best of their ability. The label should identify the hazard and include the first aid procedures if there is exposure. There's an on, this is an ongoing work in progress as we do our reorg, and uh, but we label things as we work through our, our collection. So these, does anybody know what these are? Yes, fire extinguishers that could kill you if you break one. <laughs> if you break one, run! <laughs> And don't come back. Oh, okay. <laughs> a lot of museums are draining them now. I think that's a terrible thing. They're, not, they're much prettier when they have liquid in them. And it's not perfume. It will kill you. Um, so having a health and safety program is useless if you don't have a way to share the information. So along with the program binder and written policy, and I have my binder here, if anybody wants to look at it. All staff is taken through this binder. You can hand that around. So, okay. So along with the binder and written policy, we have two health and safety centers in the museum where we post communications. One in the office and one in collections. And they're both a little different. The collections one's a little bit more collections related. The centers are intended to keep employees and volunteers informed about codes of practices, safe work procedures, emergency contact numbers, and first aiders. We, um, we printed and posted a recent copy of New Brunswick's Occupational Health and Safety Act and regulation. So that, I believe, oh, where is that? Might be in there. Yeah, it's in there. Those can go around too. Anyways, that's law. You have to post the Health and Safety Act in your workplace. Again, nothing I had ever seen before. Um, so, and that gets updated fairly regularly. So you have to keep going back and making sure you've got a recent copy. So our monthly safety inspection reports are posted here as well as other important notifications. And it's law, you have to, in New Brunswick, do a monthly uh, safety report. 
So despite training and having, a health, and safe, having health and safety centers, I've witnessed employees breaking the rules. That doesn't go over well with me. For example, I've caught them using a folding chair as a ladder on numerous occasions with a ladder right there. It's like, down, <laughs> go get yourself a ladder. Sometimes like the step stool is right there. It's like, why are you using a folding chair for Pete's sake? So therefore, I posted several copies of our WorkSafe posters in storage rooms where they may need a ladder to remind employees of ladder safety. So these posters, I have them hung everywhere. Everywhere. I did this um, for preventing trips and falls as well. So there's a trip and fall poster. And uh, we have an antique meat slicer in our collection, so I hung a nice safety poster on it so that people don't cut themselves on it. <laughs> Please don't cut yourself. Uh, these posters are produced in-house and are easy to print as many copies as I want. So I can print them by the thousands, laminate them, and post them wherever I want. So, new, uh, new employees and volunteers are given training on their first day or two at the museum. And that's actually law. You have to give them health and safety training before they start anything else. There are four levels of training. I have new employee, curatorial management, and board. Yes, my board member go through training because if something ever happened to me somebody would have to come in and fill in my place so all our training materials are located in the health and safety binder which is being handed around and is kept in the office health and safety center this binder also stores our material data sheets that go along with the women's training reports relevant meeting minutes everything there is an employee safety orientation checklist that we use to make sure we cover everything we need to cover that's that one. So that's pretty much level one of training, which is the minimal that you have to cover for the law. Um, I wish I could say that it's fun and exciting, but it's not. It's the most boring training ever. But I'm working on making it fun, but at the moment the training is dull. There's only so many hours in the day. Despite that, the employee appreciates knowing how to protect themselves. And you'd be surprised. Once they go through this dull training, they actually appreciate it. Before working in the collection, it's good to know that you should handle Second World War gas masks with extreme care because they may contain blue asbestos in their filters. That information is dry, but very important, especially in a collection like ours where we have everything. Um, management training includes information on our legal obligations. Once you know what your legal obligations are, it's difficult to ignore them. Management training is essential to the success of the program, and I have one of our summer students do the management training every year. I put that person in charge of training new volunteers in, uh, that start drawing his or her contract, and um, this year that student will also be responsible for, health, responsible for health and safety inspections during the summer. Having this level of training and responsibility is nice for the student because it looks good on a resume that they've been given this level of training. It's a skill building responsibility as well. So members of the board need training for several reasons. As I said before, if the museum doesn't have a manager such as myself, they would have to take responsibility for the program. They should also be aware of our legal obligations and they are responsible for intervening on any health and safety issues that has not been resolved within a reasonable time frame. So they are expected to provide recommendations for eliminating and preventing hazards when necessary, and they are expected to follow up on recommendations to ensure that they've been implemented. As proud as I am about having the program, it has increased my already jam-packed workload. There's not enough hours in the day. In writing this, um, represents a lot of volunteer hours on my part as well. I didn't do all this in paid time. My poor family. <laughs> I think sometimes they don't even know what I look like. <laughs> like most professionals in small institutions, we have a full plate. We often operate on volunteer power, and if we do have a paid staff, it's a small number. As the Canadian Museum Association survey recently revealed, volunteer staff far outnumbers the paid staff in this industry. Most volunteers are not here for the health and safety inspections. They want to do the fun stuff, like work with exhibits, artifacts, and programming. But I can't say I blame them because those are the things that I want to do too. But all my volunteers are treated like staff and they all go through the health and safety training. Okay. So I now have monthly safety summary report forms and in inspection checklists, annual reports and first aid inventories to manage. 
These things cannot be overlooked. I don't want to find out the hard way that my first aid kit is out of sterile gauze pads or that there's a hazard in storage that should have been looked after before someone was hurt. So according to the New Brunswick Occupational Health and Safety Act, Section 9, we have to ensure that the place of employment is inspected at least once a month. If, a, if an employee is injured in an accident, I want to know that I've done my due diligence. So it's added a lot of extra work to my plate, but I delegate upward. It's one of my skills. I'm very good at telling people what to do. So I get my board members to help. I love my board members. Let's see. Code of practice. Oh, yes, working alone. So speaking of due diligence, Working alone in my museum can be a little unnerving, not because a building is big, old, and possibly haunted. I'm told it's haunted, but I've never experienced anything like that. But because we have several questionable characters that hang out in our downtown area, like the friendly neighborhood drug dealer. Yes. <laughs> I'm used to it and don't think much about it. They're just people I pass on my way to and from work every day. But under Regulation 92-133 of the New Brunswick Occupation Health and Safety Act, I am required to establish a code of practice to ensure as far as, I'm as, far, as, far as possible the health and safety of an employee who works alone. So it must include the risks associated with working alone and the procedures to be followed in order to minimize the risks associated with working alone. And that's one thing in the museum industry, we spend a lot of time alone. And um, apparently, I had no idea there's laws around that. So I discovered that some employees really don't like to work by themselves for safety reasons. However, by having a code of practice, which is what this is here, as part of their training, it helps them become comfortable and gives them the tools they need to look after themselves in case the need arises. So I noticed a difference in my staff when I came out with this, that some people who were previously nervous about working alone weren't as nervous anymore because they had the training to, um, to look after themselves in that work situation. Um, it took several years to do this research because I'm busy running a museum at the same time. And to make it more interesting, there were changes in the law that I had to incorporate at the very last minute before taking it to my board. But once I had the research, I had to type it into a comprehensible document, which is being handed around. In 2014, my board told me to take the time during the summer and focus on typing. Uh, the, summer, it's, the summer is a good time because I have students capable of the day-to-day -day operations of the museum, so it gives me an opportunity to disappear in a dark little corner of the museum and focus. Then, as I said before, at, my, at first my board regretted encouraging me to write this once I was done, because I gave them a huge document to review, 158 pages, filled with workflows, procedures, and forms, plus supporting policies. It took them a few months to go through it, they were made aware of all the things that the museum was missing, and they appreciated the work that went into the document. So when we worked to implement the program, I delegated the initial implementation to a summer student. She created our communication centers, posted emergency numbers, and did the initial checklist. We had our first, our first aid kits were donated. A little trick of the trade, find out which stores are going out of business. <laughs> first aid kits, things like that, they usually just get trashed. I got so many first aid kits from them, <laughs> and mannequins, and stretchers, and lots of fun stuff. Anyway, so our first aid kits were donated. Um, it sounds mean, but it isn't. And installed in permanent locations so that we always know where to look for supplies. We are still fine-tuning things, but we're almost there. Um, maybe stepping on the glass wasn't the, all terrible. Having the foot doctor show me where he was going to cut off my toe was traumatic. It still bothers me to think about it, but ultimately it provided the motivation to take steps to never let it happen again. For starters, I, um, I keep flat shoes behind my desk for those moments when I need to take my heels off. They don't match every outfit. Actually, I keep four or five pairs of flat shoes behind my desk. <laughs> but they still don't match every outfit. <laughs> but they get the job done. <laughs> My first aid kits are fully stocked and inspected annually. There's always one close by. I involve everyone in health and safety. My hard-working board member, Richard, did our safety inspection this month. 
The uh, monthly inspection ensures that mysterious piles of broken glass is found and swept up. I give volunteers the same training as paid employees. They do the same work and their safety is just as important, if not more, because they're cheaper. I can afford volunteers far easier than I can afford paid employees. I've got to look after them. I also prepare and present a written annual report to the board of directors to keep them up to date on the program management. That's my favorite poster. It's missing the high heels, but that's my favorite poster. So I encourage all museums to take a look at their health and safety in their organization, and especially in their collection. You don't want an employee or volunteer to discover the hard way that the fire extinguisher grenades are deadly, or that the taxidermied elk that they are letting kids touch on a tour is preserved with arsenic. There is a museum in New Brunswick, I can go up and touch a dozen taxidermy pieces. It scares me. <laughs> Don't lick the taxidermy. Um, there are resources that you can use to develop a policy and a program on the internet. That's where I get my information. Provincial health and safety websites have a lot of great information. I called the New Brunswick Health and Safety Department numerous times while doing the research and they were happy to help me. And I mean, like I said, by the time it was done, we were on first name basis. If you expect employees and volunteers to work safely, you need to give them the training and tools they need to do it. Never take safety for granted. Make them aware of the hazards, supervise them, be a good example. Yes, be a good example. Um, <laughs> make sure that they have the equipment they need. And the extra time that you take to develop and implement a program is time well spent. There. Any questions? <laughs>